Now, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we, we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were for sacrifice to an idol, but their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, but if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against God. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for your word this morning. Father, just thank you for teaching us through your word, and I pray that you would speak to us and, and show us... Um, things we need to change in our lives, Father, and I pray that we would help each other out as brothers in Christ, Father. We would strengthen each other and be there for each other, Father. And I just pray that you be with Joey as he teaches this morning. Amen. We're going to begin 1 Corinthians chapter 8 this morning, and I intend on finishing that, but just, just a little bit of outline of where we'll be headed in the next several weeks. If you'll notice, the first verse there is now concerning things. And so from 8, 9, 10, and 11, Paul addresses the same underlying theme, okay? And he works that through several scenarios out into our Christian life. In fact, 12, 13, and 14 is all about spiritual gifts, but yet it still has this same underlying theme. And so we'll be discussing the same things over the next several weeks in different applications, but it'll always land in the same place, and it's a beautiful place to land. First of all, you remember over the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about marriage, and then in chapter 7, they had an application that Paul says was favorable. Now, you need to get this part. Their application was, you need to be single. Okay, that's what the church was teaching. But their theology about why you needed to be single was all messed up. They thought that you would make yourself more spiritual or more holy or acceptable by God, to God. And so, yes, be single, but your theology is, is just totally messed up. So Paul shoots both of it down. He teaches them the right theology, and he says, yes, it's favorable, but favorable to be single, but not for the sake of making yourself more holy, just you'll have undivided devotion to Christ. You've got to get them both right the theology or the thinking and the application. When we turn to chapter 8, their theology is great. Your thinking is great, but he says your application is horrible. And so he says, no, ain't wrong, let's start over again. Get your thinking right and your thinking will roll into right living or right actions. They're both important, church. It's not just about getting the right answers. It's about understanding God's principle and letting it flow out into your life and having the right actions. So we'll see this in chapter 8 as we walk through discussing food sacrificed to idols. Now, I want to give you some background. And don't let this overwhelm you, but I think it will help us to walk through chapter 8 in a more sensible way. That way I won't be teaching two different things at the same time. Let me give you four points that we're going to see, and I, I don't usually ABC or pointing to that, but it will help us to walk through chapter 8, and it's the four points about knowledge. Now I'm not talking about general knowledge. I'm talking about biblical principles, that sort of knowledge, not how to 
whatever, tie your shoe or that sort of thing, or change the oil in your car. I'm talking specifically about four principles regarding biblical knowledge. Number one is, it's always given by grace. If you have your Bibles, or Robin put it up for you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 4 through 6. We've already looked at this, okay? Let me read it to you. Look what Paul says. I thank my God always concerning you, look at this, for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched, it was His work, in Him, in all speech and in all knowledge. He's speaking specifically to the gospel. You didn't one day figure this out on your own. It was a work of God. It was a grace work. He opened up your heart and your mind to the gospel. You received the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus through grace and grace alone. It came no other way. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's look at one other verse and then we'll go on with our second point. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. Look at what he says here. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. The man, apart from the Spirit of God, just the flesh guy, cannot understand the wisdom of God or the knowledge of God. And here he's talking specifically about the gospel. They're spiritually appraised. He doesn't have the equipment necessary. So anything you pick up from this book, it comes by grace. Don't ever think, I got this sorted on my own. Don't ever think, well, you're just a smart guy. No, we don't get it that way. This is totally different than anything else in this world. It comes by way of grace. Second point I want to make about knowledge is it's internalized by the work of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 10. Robin put it up for you. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. Let me read the passage and then I'll explain. He says, For to us, God has revealed them through the Spirit, the wisdom of God, okay? For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but listen to this. A spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by wisdom, human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit. I call this the internalization of the word of God. Let me explain. And, and you'll really see this in chapter eight when we get there. But we get things in our head. We get understanding from scripture in our head. And for some reason, probably because of the stubbornness of the flesh, it takes a long time to trickle down to the heart, especially to work itself out into our lives. The Spirit of God is responsible for weaving the truth of God into the fabric of our lives. And to be honest with you all, we know so much more than we live. And so this process called sanctification is the process by which the Spirit of God takes this glorious book and weaves it into the fabric of our lives until we live according to this book. That's called the internalization of knowledge. It's what God, God does through His Spirit. Third thing is, I need to speed up. Third thing is, it gives us freedom. Not only is knowledge given by grace, not only is it internalized by the Spirit, it, it gives us freedom. I'll show you this in chapter 8, but for a little quicker sake this morning, if you have your Bibles, flip over to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Before you came to faith in Christ, you were a slave to sin. That's who you were. You were in bondage. When you understood the gospel, the chains fell off spiritually. 
And you were eternally free at that point. The knowledge of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ set you free from sin and death. You were no longer a slave. And it's not just about the knowledge of the gospel. Anytime that we understand principles in God's Word, you need to know it is a free thing. It's so gloriously free to walk in the Spirit. Chains are constantly falling off as we're sanctified and made holy. So the principles of God or the knowledge of God is given by grace, fleshed out or internalized by the Spirit, and it always sets you free, no matter what it is. Fourth thing and last thing is it creates opportunities. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians. I'll keep you there. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This knowledge gives us opportunity. In verse 9, look what it says. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He says, take care. Okay, you have responsibility here. Take care that this liberty or this freedom that we just talked about, this freedom of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So you say, okay, are you telling me that I can receive knowledge by grace... The Spirit of God can internalize it into my heart. It can set me free, and then I can turn it and sin against God. Yes, you can. You still have the flesh. So he says, take care with this liberty of yours that somehow you don't turn this thing and hurt your brother. Another, another word he says, don't turn there. Robbie will put it up for you. Galatians 5, 13. Look what Paul says there. Same thought, same principle. He says, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but rather love through love serve one another. Okay, so we got all these glorious things about knowledge, and I'm going to point them out as we go through chapter 8. But those are the things we need to know as we go through there, so we won't have to pause so long. It's given by grace. It's worked out through the Spirit. It gloriously gives us freedom, but... In that freedom, take care that you don't waste the opportunity that's been given you. You got it? Everybody do this. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. All right. So right out of the gate, Paul Talk, begins to talk about this pagan social festival when he says things sacrificed to idols. Let me give you just a little bit of background here so it'll help you. In Corinth, these pagan festivals was the centerpiece of the culture. It involved all of culture and it was how they worshiped their gods and it was a big eating thing, okay? They would sacrifice the animals and at the sacrifice, they would take the food and actually eat at the festival. They would take some of the food home and at the home they would continue to celebrate the festival and eat these animals sacrificed. And then you could go to the market after the great sacrifice and you could buy the food that had been sacrificed and continue worshiping these pagan idols as you partook in eating this thing. Is this still going today? Absolutely. It goes on in Nepal. Every five years, they sacrifice about 200 to 250,000 animals. And all of these people groups, these Nepalese, come out. This huge festival that these men walk around with swords. And they just heads off of buffaloes and animals. People going nuts, worshiping pagan gods. They eat at the festival. They drag the meat home. They take it in their table. It still goes on today. It's a center of their culture. Now, to give you some sort of relationship here, think about Thanksgiving. It impacts our entire culture. No, we don't sacrifice the turkey, but we take it home and we eat it and we celebrate. It's woven into the fabric of being an American. So you need to know the depth of which this means when Paul's talking about food sacrificed to an idol as a part of their culture. Everybody did this from little all the way to old. This is what we do. This is who we are. Okay? So you need that context as we walk through these things. Now look what Paul says. We know that we all have knowledge. 
I showed you in first in first Corinthians chapter one, verses four. I don't think I did. Turn there to first Corinthians chapter four. I did, but let me make sure and make this point again. First Corinthians verse one, chapter four. Paul's already recognizes. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. So Paul's already recognized this fact. And he says, you know, we all have this. But look what he says next. Back in chapter eight, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Now, let me tell you what Paul is not doing at this point. He's not pitting knowledge against love. Don't see that. That's what television preachers do. We just need to forget about knowledge and we just need to love everybody. No, this is not what Paul's saying at all. He's saying knowledge has the potential to be, make us arrogant. But the purpose of this knowledge is to go on and demonstrate love. Love edifies. Love builds up. So knowledge has the potential. You know what the flesh does anytime it receives something that not everybody has? What do we do when we possess something that not everybody has? Lift ourselves up and we push others down. Because I've got something you don't have. And Paul's already warning us, listen, knowledge can do this. You can gain some kind of understanding in Scripture. And the flesh will actually take that and go, oh, I know. And you don't. And you can wind up belittling or criticizing your brother or sister in Christ because it hadn't quite clicked yet. So it has this potential of making us arrogant. Look what he says in verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. He says, If anyone supposes, I love that, that he knows anything... He has not yet known as he ought to know. In other words, if you have knowledge, if you have an understanding about biblical things, and it's yet to cause you to love and to serve others, that knowledge you have is impotent right now. It's powerless. It is not yet known as you ought to know it. You don't understand it. If your glorious biblical principle that you've got hammered out in your life has not led you to love other people, you don't fully understand it yet. It's what Paul is trying to teach us. Now, we know that knowledge is just incomplete anyway. If you have your Bibles, and Robbie put it up there again, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Look at what God's Word says. This is not what Paul's talking about, but I want to show you this. He says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. No matter what we think we know, you need to understand, right now, you don't really know it fully. I don't care what it is. When we get to glory and stand before our Lord prayerfully, we're going to know deeper truths about biblical principles. But right now, I don't care what you say you know, or I don't care what you say you've got hammered out. You don't fully understand it. And frankly, I would be really disappointed if I did. That's part of getting to go to glory and be in the presence of God, to know things more fully. So... You may feel proud about something you got hammered out, but don't feel too proud because Paul says right now you don't have it totally figured out anyway. It's just not possible. But I don't think he's talking about this. I think that Paul's referring to an incompleteness here. Look back at, the, look back at chapter 8, verse 2. He says, If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he's not yet known as he ought to know. In other words, you ought to know. This is something you ought to know. He's already addressed this. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We've already talked about this. Look what Paul, he hammers them about this a little bit. Look at verse 18. He says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. Paul's getting on to them for their glorious 
what they thought was their glorious understanding of Scripture. And Paul says, dude, at best you're halfway there because your understanding hasn't caused you to love. It hasn't led you to love. It's caused you to distinguish. I know something Jeremy doesn't know. Sorry, Jer. I'd be glad to explain it to you. Paul would say, you dummy. You, you don't know. True biblical knowledge would never cause you to think that way. You don't fully understand it like you ought to understand it. He does this. I know I'm, I'm, I'm staying in 1 Corinthians, but I know I'm showing you several things. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, same thing works out with spiritual gifts. Like I said, it's the same principle for the rest of this book for several chapters. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let me read verses 1 through 5. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. prophesy. Think about teaching or preaching. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies or preaches speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies or preaches edifies the whole church. So you've got these gifts, he says, but you know where you're using them? You're using them for your own glory and for yourself. You really don't understand your spiritual gift till you're using it for other people. Back up one chapter to chapter 13, look at verse 1, and then you'll understand this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and I have all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, what are you? You're nothing. You see how serious of a matter this is? It's not just about knowing biblical principles. You're just halfway there. It's about letting the biblical principles move you to serve self-sacrificing service and love. It concerns me about the way that I preach. Because we're learning things. I'm learning things as I get into God's Word. And it, we're just really understanding things we've probably never, some of you may have never seen or understood before. But you know what? At best, you're halfway there and no further. Unless what we learn, unless what we understand when we come in here, if it's not driving us to love, we're hitting foul balls all the time. All this stuff has got to change who we are and cause us to serve and to love or we're wasting our time. If you have a glorious spiritual gift, and by the way, you all have one given to you by the Spirit of God, it's glorious. But if it's not leading you to serve and to love, it's, you might as well put it on the shelf. You're not using it for the purpose that it was given to you. Okay? All right, let's go back. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. We could spend the rest of our time on this passage, but I'm not going to. Let me, let me interpret it for you, literally. It says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. can also be literally interpreted, but if anyone loves, now they really know. So when you get to the place where all this is causing you to love. Paul says, now you got it. You got it. You're letting your biblical principles and knowledge really function for the reason it was given to you. Okay? All right, now, he gets into the example in verse 4. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things, he says, let's get to the subject. Sacrifice to idols... We know, okay, that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords in the minds of people, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist 
Notice the word for. We exist for Him and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things and we exist through Him. Paul says there's the knowledge. We know this. All of you that are worshiping pagan idols, that would not be us, but all of you that are worshiping pagans, you need to know there's but one Lord and one God. There's your knowledge and we know this. If there's any other gods that these people recognize, whether they be Allah or whether they be Buddha or whether they be Gidamai, which is the God that they worship in Paul as Hindu, Paul says you need to know they're so-called. They're figments of their imagination. They're not real. There's one Lord. There's one God. That's what you know. Okay? Look at verse 7. This is where he turns it. However... Not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. You know what I talked about when we started the internalization of God's principle? This is it. This is it in verse 7. Let's just say we're in Nepal and we present the gospel to a brother or sister, and, and they, they believe. They gloriously see him as the one true God and the one true Lord Jesus Christ. And they just repent, and they believe, and they get baptized. They're following the Lord. But you know what the problem is? Their entire lives, their culture, has been celebrating these pagan gods and worshiping with this meat and these sacrifices. And even though he's been gloriously set free, there's always going to be this little reminder in his mind that every time he sits down at a table and it's a steak, you know what's going to come flooding back into his heart? My past, when I worshiped the wrong God. And if he's like me, I don't want to remember my past. I don't want nothing to remind me of my past. And you can preach to him all day, but there's a process that he's going to have to go through where the Spirit of God just washes all that out and cleanses him when he can finally sit down and eat a steak and say, Praise God, I don't care about my past. There's one true God and I'm free. I'm free. But friend, it's going to be a long time before he's there. It's not going to happen like that. What if you got saved? What if Thanksgiving's a pagan holiday and you got saved? Okay? And I invite you over to my house and I smoked a big turkey on the Traeger. And you sit down. What is that going to remind you of? Your pagan past. It was always a part. I mean, since I was a child, I love Thanksgiving. It's family. It's food everywhere. It's this huge celebration. I love it. I love it. It's one of my favorite holidays of the year. And if, I, if, if that was a part of my sinful past and I walked away from that, then I go over to your house and you feed me turkey? I mean, is that right? You've got the glorious freedom because it's... You understand knowledge, but I'm getting there. I'm not there yet. I'm weak, in my, I'm weak in my knowledge and the Spirit of God's got some work to do. Let Him do it. Don't you hinder that. You see how this is working out? This is so much a part of our lives. So the work's got to be done. There's got to be an internalization of the Word of God because they're accustomed to it. Look what it says. Being accustomed to the idol until now, as if it were. Oh, their, their past is just on the edge. It's just right there, and they don't want to go back. Don't dare take them back. Verse 8. He goes back to knowledge. He goes back to the freedom Man, Paul, God knows how to write, right? But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. Your knowledge has set you free, my friend. 
Isn't that glorious? Remember last week? Circumcised or uncircumcised? Paul says it don't matter. It's nothing. It's the call of God that made you significant. Should I be a slave or should I try to get free? Paul says it doesn't matter. It's the call of God that's made you significant. Should I get married or, or, or stay single? Paul says it doesn't matter. Do what you want to do. It's the call of God that's made, made you significant. And we come to the table. Should I eat the meat or not eat the meat? Paul says it doesn't matter. It's the call of God that's made you significant. That's the knowledge. Isn't that freeing? Isn't that freeing that our brother in Nepal, when he comes to faith in Christ, hopefully in this lifetime, the Spirit of God will do so much of a work that he'll sit down. He can eat and not think about his past in that idol worship. What a freeing moment. You sit there crying and you'll say, I'm sorry if I didn't cook that right. He says, no, it has nothing to do with that. It has the fact that I'm free. I can eat now and my conscience is not burdened. So this is the freedom that knowledge gives us. You say, well, Brother Joy, I don't think y'all actually call me Brother Joy. You say, Joy, um, do you teach? Yes. Do you teach them? Yes. But there's a way. In fact, we could stop right now and go through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Paul's teaching Timothy how you teach these things. In fact, he tells them in 1 Timothy, you don't have to turn there, chapter 1, verse 5, the goal of our instruction, Timothy, is, guess what? Love. So there is a time to teach. Brother, listen. I know you came out of this pagan past, but listen, food has nothing to do with anything. You'll teach him that in a very gracious and loving way. But there's a time for that. There's a place for that. There's a way for that. And Paul tells Timothy how to do that. But now is not the time. His conscience is weak. So Paul goes on. Corinth, certainly not the time in, in, in the Corinth in the Bible. Look at verse 9. He says, take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For those of you who diligently study the passage, take care is in the present active imperative. You know what that means? Active, it's totally your responsibility. Imperative, you better do this. Present tense, you will always do this. It will be the habit of your life. You will always be taking care with your liberties so as not to offend a weaker brother. It's on you. Your liberty gives you a burden, a responsibility. Take care. Okay? Now, like I said, Something terrible happens to us when we get knowledge, remember? It, we'll, we'll turn it. We'll use it to glorify ourselves. I know this. You don't. And you miss the glorious opportunity you have to exalt the Lord by taking care. Isn't that something? I'm just going to guard my liberty. I treasure my liberty. Thank you, Father, for my liberty. I just I can't believe you set me free here. But I know that there's others around me that struggle with these things, Father, so I'm going to guard this. I'm going to protect this liberty so as not to offend them or hurt their faith. Let's go on, verse 10. For if someone sees you, look at that. If someone just sees you, you who have knowledge... Dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, will he not be strengthened to go back and to eat the things sacrificed to idols? Just sees you. You see how much care we have to have? Let's go back to the turkey, the pagan turkey. You go to Six Flags. You ever seen those turkey drumsticks? Man, those things are awesome. And you say, well, I'm going to get one. You get your turkey, you're walking around with a drumstick, you take your big old bite, you're around the corner and there's that brother <laughs> that recently came to faith in Christ that got saved from turkeys. You go, uh, boy, I found this pagan thing on the ground. Where can I throw it in the trash? That's the concern. 
I don't know how it got in my mouth. <laughs> That's the concern. Don't you dare flaunt your freedom in front of a weaker brother. Be so concerned that, ah, oh, he can't even see me. Even though I may be enjoying my liberty. Back to verse 11. Let's look what it says. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The King James has the word perish. I'll, I'll show you why I don't like perish. Some people think loses salvation. We know that's not, a, that's not possible. But let's keep reading. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brother and wounding their conscience. See, now he's talking about, what he's, he's getting down to it, wounding their conscience. You're not going to make him lose his salvation. You know what you're going to do? You're going to walk up with a pickaxe and take a chip out of the foundation of his faith. You're not going to send him to hell. You're going to put a crack in his belief system. Don't you dare do that. Don't you dare wound his conscience. Because look what he says. By sinning against your brother, you sin against Christ. See how serious this is? You mean to tell me that I can be given knowledge by the grace of God. The Spirit of God can internalize this truth and it can set me gloriously free and then I can turn that and sin against Christ who gave this to me? You better believe it. You can take the gift of God and turn around and sin against God by exalting yourself. He gets it. We should all be crying. You know why? Because we all do this. You know what it reminds me of? Remember the conversation between the Lord and Cain? I love the way the Lord put it. He said, where's your brother, Abel? Where's your brother? Remember what Cain said? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. You most certainly are your brother's keeper. You treasure your brother. You treasure their faith. You know where your brother is and you take care with your liberties. You always know where your brothers and sisters are spiritually and take care of them. Look at the commitment Paul makes in verse 13. Therefore, here's your conclusion. If food causes my brother to stumble... I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. See, he gets that. He gets his liberty. Paul, you can eat anything you want. Paul says, I'll never eat it again because I love my brother. We talk a lot about gospel living. Cute phrase, isn't it? Gospel-centered living. We need to live gospelly. And when we think of that, we think about the lost. Now pay attention. This is where I'm landing the plane. We think about gospel-centered living and we think about, this is how I live in regard to lost people in order to win them to faith in Christ. That's just half of it, you understand. There is gospel-centered living to our brothers in our sisters in Christ. It's very gospely. It's when we have this glorious liberty, but we don't take advantage of it because we know if I take advantage of my liberty, it might wound my brother. And I refuse. I refuse to wound my brother. So I will lay my liberty down in order to love my brother. That's gospel living. Last verse, turn over to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. 
Robbie will put it up for you. Look at this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look at this. Who, although He existed in the form of God, this is what He had, His glorious Godness did not regard or hang on to a quality with God, a thing to be grasped. He was God. He didn't grasp that. He didn't hang on to that. But look what He did. He emptied Himself. Taking the form of a bondservant. Why would He do that? He had this liberty. He had this freedom. He had these angels worshiping Him. Why didn't He hang on to that? Because He set that down to come and make a way for who would become his brothers and sisters in Christ. He had a freedom. And he chose to lay that down and become a slave for me and for you. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. Now here, sum it up. You've been graced. You've got knowledge. You've got a lot of knowledge. And a lot of you have just had the Spirit of God just weave the wonderful principles of God's Word out into your hearts and in your lives, okay? He's just internalized this truth. And you've gloriously been set free. You've been set free. Now you can live gospelly. You can be gospel-centered. You know how? Lay some of those freedoms down. And serve and love. And you will complete that knowledge you've been given. It will run its full course. It will do exactly what it's supposed to do as you sacrificially serve one another in Christ and paint the most beautiful picture of the gospel, the same picture our Lord painted for us. Let's pray.